Good morning. Today we start talking about the weapons of World War I. The weapons of World War I are what actually made things different, what actually made uh, things change and made World War I such a different war, such a different place and, uh, and so we remember in history. When the war began, people had not fought a war in Europe for 40, 50 years. So most people did not remember what war was like. World War I, though, changed all that. It resulted in massive losses. I mean, the, the number of uh, people killed and the number of soldiers uh, wounded was totally different from what anybody had ever seen before. Okay? There were more than 65 million soldiers mobilized for the war. 65 million people on all sides. Out, out of those 65 million, over 10 million were killed and over 20 million were wounded. So almost half of all the soldiers who took part in the war were hurt, killed in some way. World War I created a new kind of war. Uh, and it's a war of the trenches. Back in the day, uh, the, you know, soldiers would line up and then they would charge at each other in big, huge lines. And that's the way that war had been fought for, you know, hundreds of years. The way that Napoleon fought. The way that the, the George Washington fought. But this was a brand new type of war. And it started with, uh, with trenches. Trenches are basically just big holes dug in the ground. Big holes where people could easily hide. And they could, uh, you know... Not, uh, not get hit by bullets when you're down in the trench. And the reason why you have trenches is simple, because uh, when you're inside the trench, uh, you can't be shot at. And when somebody's coming to attack you, you can stay in the trench and for cover and uh, shoot at the, at the people who are attacking you. And so you would be able to beat back any attack, you know, pretty easily. Because uh, in order to get there, you know, you have to cross across the the trenches in the killing zone, which is called no man's land. No man's land is the area between the trenches of of the British and the trenches of the Germans. And even though the war had changed, the generals, the leaders of the army, still tried to fight the war using the same old tactics. They still tried to use the same way they, of doing things. So like I said before... Uh, back in Napoleon's time, uh, George Washington's time, you know, the guns would be able to shoot once, and then you have to reload. Uh, the the very, very best uh, British soldiers uh, who trained and trained and trained, they could uh, shoot, uh, reload, and shoot again uh, probably about three times in one minute. And so uh, the way that you would fight was you'd line up all in a big line, and then uh, you'd have... Uh, all your soldiers would shoot and then reload and then uh, you know half of them shoot and then half of them shoot and then, while the other ones reload and uh, you know the guns were were good but they didn't shoot very far and so you couldn't shoot very much however with trench warfare things kind of got stuck and and, bail, and uh, bogged down. So in order to attack the enemy, the generals would call this. They'd call for a large group of soldiers. First they would shoot cannons at the other side. They would bombard it for, you know, hours, and then they would order the, enemy, the, the soldiers to attack the enemy by jumping out of the trenches and running over toward them and attacking them, you know, shooting them and, you know, attacking them. Uh, this was called going over the top. So climbing out of the hole, going over the top of the trench, and attacking it. So if we see a picture here of soldiers getting ready to go over the top, uh, they would all synchronize their watches, make sure everybody has the same time, and they're getting ready to crawl out. And so they would wait for the signal, usually a whistle, and everyone would jump out of the trench all at the same time. And here we are a second later, climbing over the top, and as you can see, one of the soldiers already got hit already. Uh, that's the problem with jumping out of your hole. If you, uh, once you're out of there, then the enemy can see you and they, of course, can shoot you. And so the war, which everybody thought would last only, you know, two, maybe three weeks, 
suddenly bogged down. The 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 war just there were massive massive casualties and neither side was winning. It was called a stalemate, and uh, part of the re both sides were looking for any type of advantage to break the trench warfare. So why did the soldiers need to hide in the trenches? Well, it's because the war creates new ways of killing people. And a war really spurs on inventions. And World War I is the first war in which the Industrial Revolution, all the new inventions, all of the manufacturing, all of the industrial wealth created is applied to war. Taking all the machines and saying, what can we do to make war even, well, be even better at war? You know, war is one of those things that really spurs on inventions, really makes people come up with new ideas. And unfortunately, new inventions happen all the time because of war. Uh, take uh, Velcro. Velcro is invented, you know, during the war, during World War II, to, you know, attach things. The cell phone. The cell phone is developed because of, uh, you know, satellite technology. Satellites are invented so that... Uh, well, you could shoot missiles even faster across uh, across the world. The most important invention that really set the tone for World War One was the machine gun. And the machine gun. Remember, I said that the you know really good soldier uh, before the war could shoot. Uh, maybe three times a minute because you know you have to shoot and then you'd have to reload and then uh, then you could shoot again and uh, really you know three times a minute is not very fast uh, they invented revolvers you know little uh, pistols that could shoot six shots but uh, you know the revolver can't shoot very far now some of you might have seen movies of cowboys and stuff where they had uh, machine guns you know and the there's guns that would like shoot over and over again there was like six six guns attached in one and uh those kind of that's called a gatling gun it was invented as early as 1862 and uh people experimented with it but it wasn't until just before world war 1 in 1913 that the invention the war that the invention of the machine gun was was perfected because the, well, the guns would overheat and they'd melt and they'd explode and you know they kill the people using them and that's not very good. So the, it wasn't until then that it was perfected and the earliest machine guns they could shoot uh, 200 to 250 rounds per minute. So compare that to one guy shooting you know three bullets per, per minute and all of a sudden you have uh, one guy who could shoot 250 rounds per minute and that's a game changer. That really changes everything. This picture is a German heavy machine gun. It's, uh, well, it's heavy. You needed four to six soldiers to operate it. You need to carry it, to move it around. Uh, it was water-cooled. That's what the big invention was. They would use it to cool down the barrel of the gun so that it wouldn't explode, wouldn't melt down, and kill everybody using it. That was the bad thing. The good thing it would wipe out any frontal assault. Anybody attacking it, you know, even if you got like, you know, 300 soldiers attacking, you know, they'd all be uh, shot very, very quickly. So it doesn't matter how brave or how fast you run, you would still be wiped out by this machine gun. The next invention was, you know, wasn't even invented for the war. It was invented for the farms in the United States is barbed wire and you guys are f probably familiar with barbed wire it's just wire that has little tiny uh, sharp bits of metal and uh, it was developed so that when cows come up against it they feel it and, you know it's got like little needles in it they feel it and so they they stop and you know it's a really cheap way of creating fencing is all over the place and uh, when it was put to war it was something that they would that you couldn't sneak past. You know, if you uh, tried to go through it, you'd have to go through very, very slowly. Um, sometimes they put like uh, rattles on it so that it would be like an alarm. And if you get caught on it, you know, you're stuck, and you, you know, you have to try to try to pick your way out of it. And while you're doing that, you can be you're a easy target for people to shoot you. Now, the worst weapon of them all. 
the one that really set World War I apart was poison. Poison gas. Now, poison gas is, well, it's just that. It's a, a odorless, um, you know, cloud that if you breathe it, it would kill or injure you. Uh, part of the, 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 what really made it horrible was that, you know, there was no, def there was no real defense against it. You know, there was, uh, the, the types of gas that they had, it, what it was, you'd breathe it in and it would expand the, your lungs. It would make them so big that, uh, you couldn't breathe anymore and you'd suffocate and you'd suffocate to death. Poison gas is scary. It's one of the scariest types of weapons there are. It's not the most effective, though. You know, it, what you need to do is you need to breathe it in. And so in the early days, if you, they would shoot off the gas, and uh, if the wind was going towards the enemy, great. It would blow it over towards them. Uh, the problem is if the wind changed, it could blow it back on you. But, of course, you know, if you're prepared, there is uh, stuff you could wear, uh, the gas masks, uh, the ty types of, well, the first, the two types of gas is mustard gas, which is created from the mustard seed. Uh, think about how, when you eat mustard, uh, it's hot, it's uh, spicy, and it causes you to, uh, um, your eyes to water. Well, that's uh, just a little teeny tiny bit. Imagine a whole lot of it that would uh, cause your eyes to water, that would cause your, uh, your, your lungs to seize up. Same thing with chlorine. Chlorine is the stuff that they put in swimming pools to kill bugs. And uh, it's okay for you to swim in it because it's such a small amount. But imagine a large amount breathing it in. That would kill you. The defense that soldiers came up with was what a uh, well, gas mask. You know, it's a, a, rubber ma a rubber mask that you put over your head. Uh, it prevents any ox anything from coming in. And you'd have like a little filter to breathe through it that was supposed to take screen out the the poison gas and it was pretty effective you know it worked pretty well for most of the gases uh, unless of course you had a hole in your hole in your mask you know and uh, soldiers did not like to wear the mask because you know imagine if you wear a big uh, big rubber hood over you it's it's hot there's no air coming in so you can't breathe very well and all you can do is see out through the little uh, goggles to the side, so you can't really see very much. And if you're fighting and you can't see, well, you're pretty much dead, because, you know, anybody can sneak up on you. So soldiers only put on the mask when they absolutely had to. And um, if the mask wasn't good quality, then it would have, you know, it would break. Uh, today, you know, people get scared about poison gas. You know, poison gas, uh, the United States evaded Iraq because... Uh, the United States thought they had poison gas. Now, of all the weapons of war of the, uh, that would happen, uh, this is the only weapon that was so terrible that after the war, every single country in the world got together and agreed that they would never use poison gas in war again. And when World War II happened, what do you think, uh, when World War II happened 20 years later, what do you think happened? That's right. Not a single country used poison gas in war. In fact, the only country that has used poison gas in war since then is Iraq. Iraq was the one used, uh, Saddam Hussein used poison gas against the Kurdish people in the late 1990s. Now, another invention you might be familiar with is the hand grenade. A hand grenade is basically a small bomb. It's got a little trigger on it, a little pin. You pull the pin, and then you have 10 seconds to throw it, and it'll explode. Uh, that's good because, you know, you can carry this small bomb around with you, and you could uh, throw it as far as you can and uh, without, you know, hopefully not get shot. And it would, you know, pretty exp explosive. But, of course, if you throw it too soon, then, uh, you know, whoever you threw it at, they can just pick it up and throw it back at you. The next uh, invention uh, was the tank. Okay, The tank basically is a gigantic car. It's a gigantic car that is built to go over mud. It's built to go over anything, places where there aren't roads. And so the tanks were first invented by the British. Basically, you just put armor on top of a car, and uh, 
Well, cars get stuck in the mud, though. So how do you do it? Well, you take what we call tracked treads. And tracked treads, well, it's just a, like a tractor. They are built so that they could go over anything. They could go through it. And, uh, well, it's, it was really uh, amazing. Here's another. Uh, this is a British tank. Uh, they were big, they were powerful, they were, you know, armored, so they were basically bulletproof. But, uh, and, you know, you arm it with a big cannon and big cannon in it, and so they could shoot, and it's very mobile. It could move around. Uh, the first tanks, uh, they were big and heavy. They could move about three or four miles per hour, so they were kind of really slow. They broke down too much, though, and uh, they came too late to make a difference during the war. Uh, but, you know, there, there will make a difference in the next war because it was the net new newest invention. It was just kind of foreshadowing what things were to come. Airplanes had just been invented, uh, basically 1906. The Wright brothers in the United States uh, they invented them, and then, well, by 1914, uh, somebody got the brilliant idea: why don't we use them to spy? Okay, you know, the airplanes back in those times, they were the the two winged ones. They have a uh, two wings you know above each other uh, some of them had three you know it's just more stability uh, they were used first to just spy on the other side you know you'd look down you'd see where the enemy is and then uh, you fly back and tell the tell your side where they're at well you know while they're flying up there one of them uh, one guy carried a, a gun with him and he started shooting at other people pretty soon they uh, they started carrying hand grenades uh, they couldn't carry very much because it's really small planes. Uh, then eventually they put machine guns on them. Uh, the first machine guns, uh, you know, you had a problem because the planes were had a propeller, and if you shoot the wrong time, you could shoot your plane, shoot up your own plane. Until finally somebody figured out, you know, math. You say, how do you shoot, uh, how do you shoot a machine gun through your propeller? Well, it's timing. You know, you know how fast your propeller is rotating. You know how fast your sh your machine gun can shoot, and so they had uh, using math, they figured out how to shoot through the propeller without damaging your propeller. And of course, pilots, when they had machine guns, started shooting at each other. These were called dogfights, and uh, an ace was a, a pilot who shot down five enemy planes. The uh, best German ace was a pilot known as the Red Baron who shot down 80 Allied airplanes. The best uh, American pilot was a guy named Eddie Rickenbacker. I believe he shot down like about 15. Right. And of course the pilots were the most famous heroes of the war. They were the ones who got in all the movies and all the comic books and everything being the 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 dashing heroes that everybody wanted to to be and everybody wanted to see. The last invention we're going to talk about today is the submarine. Submarines are basically boats that can go underwater. And uh, how does a boat go underwater? Well, you know, you just fill up all the, the holes in it so it makes it watertight on the top and the bottom. They have these uh, giant uh, tanks inside the, inside the boat that you fill up with water so that it becomes very heavy and it sinks underneath the water. Uh, when you want to come out, you let the the water out of the tanks and it rises back up to the surface. The uh, submarines, you know, people had tried using submarines in war for a very, very long time, uh, but uh, it wasn't until World War I that they perfected them, that they made them big enough to, to that they could go for a very long time, and that they carried uh, torpedoes. Torpedoes are basically underwater missiles that could go through the water, and uh, when it hits, the, they shoot it at a ship, when it, hit, it hits the ship, and there's a bomb attached to the torpedo, it explodes and creates a big hole in the ship, and so the ship sinks. Now, this, the, uh, the British, of course, had the best navy in the world, so the uh, Germans, in order to fight against that navy, they built hundreds of submarines, which were they called U-boats, Unterseeboots. Now, the British had them, the Americans had them, but the Germans were the ones who really, really used them. The, uh, what kind of boats did they attack? Well, you could attack, uh, you know, Navy ships and everything, but uh, really the most effective was against cargo ships, um, unarmed ships that, uh, 
you know, full of uh, soldiers or people or uh, guns or, um, you know, supplies that were being taken to the enemy.